For its fourth edition, the Special Operations Forces Forum is hosted by Belgium with the assistance of the Belgian SOCOM, the Special Operations Command. Uh, this is an international event that gathers lecturers, both military and civilians, for points of interest of anything regarding the Special Forces uses around the world. Yeah, my name is Stuart Braden. I'm the President and CEO of the Global Special Operations Foundation. I spent 32 years in the U.S. Army Special Operations community. I retired in 2014 and I helped found the Global Special Operations Foundation, which is a professional association for special operations. This is the 2019 Global uh, Special Operations Symposium Europe. Um, this is the fourth one we've done in Europe. We did the first one in Vilnius, Lithuania, the second one in Bucharest, Romania. Last year we were in uh, Madrid, Spain, and now we're doing the fourth one here in Brussels with uh, our counterparts are jointly hosting it with us, the, the Belgian Special Operations Command. When we do these types of events, you know, what we do is we have a round table at all the previous events, and then we, we solicit requests from the special operations community on what they want the narratives to be and what they want the subjects to be. This one's uh, focused a lot on uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and basically how to build multinational headquarters. We've got all these corporate partners. We're, uh, we're made up of uh, over 2,000 individual members from 60 countries, and then we have uh, 89 separate corporate partners. And so we are a, you know, we're one of the few organizations in the world that's a professional association for special operations, and we rely heavily on our industry partners to help us ensure that our, our forces have the, the, the cutting edge material they need to win every fight. The topics are driven by what the community wants to hear from, and we try to find the, 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 the experts uh, in that field. It's very beneficial that we're here. On day one, there was the EU and NATO special operations uh, government-only session all day, which was fantastic. They brings them together once a year. And so I think we had almost 90 people in that. And so they talk about the issues that the EU and the NATO special operations want to cover. Uh, day two, and we bring in uh, we bring in other uh, senior leaders from all. Yesterday we had the chief of defense from the Netherlands, chief of defense from Belgium. We had the special operations commander for the, the Danish forces, which are forming that that uh, multinational special operations headquarters between Denmark, Netherlands, and Belgium. And we also had the chairman of the military committee for the EU, uh, General Graziani. So. It depends. We want senior leadership's view and, and keys on certain things that they're doing, you know, inside the armed forces in support of special operations. So our Global Soft Foundation is now existing for a certain number of years and uh, twice a year they organize uh, such a conference. So always one time in the US, one time in Europe. Uh, now it's the second time that there was also a NATO uh, EU conference the first day. So that was also a really interesting uh, aspect for us. It's also in some way a recognition for uh, the work we've done in the soft domain the last years. First of all, the conferences. Uh, as we had uh, very uh, high level speakers uh, with uh, very interesting teams, I think uh, the conference was a success. So we had, for instance, uh, a panel with uh, the Belgian shot, uh, the Danish SOCOM commander and the Dutch V shot talking about uh, their ideas on uh, SOF and on the future, so it was really interesting. We also had some uh, conferences about uh, innovative uh, projects. Uh, we talked, uh, for instance, um, about uh, a project we are conducting in uh, Niger about uh, the work, uh, a new type of work with military assistance towards the local population. Very interesting. Uh, we also had some, some other shorter presentations uh, who were, t who were uh, really interesting uh, to attend. Uh, th this uh, as a first part. Then a second part was uh, of course uh, the exhibition here in the hall of the hotel. Uh, allowing, uh, allowing us to have uh, many contacts with the industry, learning about uh, new innovations. And one of them for instance um, was uh, a new type of ammunition which uh, can be used underwater and then, of course, you have the, the third part of, um, uh, let's say, the, the, third, the third part of importance for such kind of event is uh, the networking part. So uh, many nations were present here. Uh, in between the different uh, conferences, we had a lot of time to discuss with our partners and uh, share experiences, uh, good practices. So that's also a, a very positive point of this kind of conference. 
Uh, yes, my name is Odd Leonardsen and I'm the sales and marketing director for DSG Technology. Yeah, so there's, uh, we have a super cavitating ammunition, which means that uh, when you shoot the ammunition from air into the water or from the water up into the air, it will uh, work seamlessly. It's a cavitating round. So it's the only thing that will basically be in contact with the water is the tip of the ammunition. And it will have a bubble of air created around the body of the uh, projectile, which makes it has very little drag and it continues almost as fast as if it would have been shot in the air. If you shoot an, a normal uh, projectile into the water, it will go uh, for a feet or two before it stops and it just falls down to the bottom. And our ammunition for a standard 308 uh, projectile, it will have an effective, uh, it, it will have effect after 16 meters in water. If you go up into the 50 cal, then it will, have, it will travel 60 meters in water. It can be shot in any firearm, but there are some uh, limitations because of, uh, we need to have a specific length of uh, the barrel and a specific twist. And if you're going to shoot from a submerged position, it needs to be a gas piston driven weapon. So, and all that information is available on our web pages to get recommendations on the barrel lengths and the twist. We have started to, to sell uh, test badges of prototypes to different governments. Uh, so now the testing phase has started with our ammunition. Uh, we will start our mass production uh, at the end of this year. FN Airstyle is presenting its new ballistic calculator. Here mounted on an FN SCAR HPR, but it can be dismounted, used separately. This calculator provides the shooter with all the indications regarding the clicks he has to put on the goggle to uh, adjust his fire. This new ballistic calculator from FN Airstyle is the most compact, high performance weapon mounted range finder on the market. The all-in-one system can be attached to all squat weapons and offers multiple user features, just like ballistic calculator, visible and infrared laser pointer, variable infrared illuminator, laser range finder, connectivity. The FN ballistic calculator replaces all other designation accessories and adds SIM adjustment capability. The system includes an advanced laser range finder and can measure a human-sized target at a distance of up to 1,750 meters without having to change firing position. The system features an integrated ballistic solver that provides real-time firing solutions. And last but not least, the state-of-the-art OLED screen displays relevant and accurate ballistic correction data. Uh, my name is Timothy Moore. I'm the International Sales Manager for Revision Military and I'm here at uh, the Soft Symposium to talk about our range of products today. Um, I'm going to start firstly with Soldier Power. Okay, this is a new development for us as an organisation and we've got essentially uh, three bits of kit to show you. We've got the batteries, which the solo pack battery here. We've got the share pack battery here, which is the big brother of this little battery here. We've got the adaptive battery charger and then we've got these power managers, the SPM and the IPM. What we've done with them is we've actually developed this system which has a chassis, which you can see in this Pelican case, and then a series of adapters. And these adapters can basically, they have a microchip in there, you put the battery in and it automatically charges. You can connect this up to a solar panel, a wind turbine, so essentially you can live off the land in terms of where you get your energy from. We also have our latest goggle, cold weather goggles here. You know, you've got a double walled goggle, so there's no, the, the, the fog resistance is minimal and you have a wire loom which is attached to the goggle so there's no cold gaps between the goggle and the face. Okay. Moving over to our helmet systems here. So we've got a legacy helmet, the A3 Viper in a high cut here. And then we've got uh, our brand new helmet which is a Cayman ballistic helmet. Okay. Um, for want of a better word, you know, this is, a, this is a Gen 5 helmet, this is a Gen 6 helmet. The, the critical difference is weight. This is an aramid and this is a polyethylene helmet. 
and this is weighing in at about one and a half kilos, just under one and a half kilos. This is weighing in at just over a kilo. So a significant weight difference to the operator. So really, we want to try and minimize the amount of weight that's being borne on the head. Finally, we have our, our, our new headset. This will be uh, available uh, middle of next year uh, as a product. It's going through final assessment at the moment. And it does two jobs. The first job is to obviously provide hearing protection. The second job is to provide uh, communications as well. What's different about this is the fact that we have four microphones. So two at the front and then two at the back. And what that allows you to do is have situational awareness and separation awareness on the network. So you can have four radios and there'll be zones. So you have zero alpha here, one zero, two zero, three zero. And so you'll hear them in different elements of the headset. Okay, I'm a retired Command Sergeant Major uh, Rick Lamb and uh, from the U.S. Army Special Forces. Started out as a young Ranger private and uh, retired as a Command Sergeant Major out of the 5th uh, Special Forces Group. Yeah, this is the, uh, the M1943 uh, field uniform. It was, uh, was kind of modeled after the paratrooper uniform of uh, World War II. And uh, this, is, uh, this was an upgrade for the U.S. Army uh, in 1943. Lessons learned you know, in, uh, in, the, in the previous conflicts. So it, uh, it was a field jacket, had many pockets because the guys were finding that the, they would have to go into, uh, into combat with about three days of rations and, uh, and equipment. So it had leg pockets, it had uh, several, you know, two chest pockets and two, uh, two hip pockets, if you will. And then, of course, there was a load carrying equipment or uh, um, you know, harness and, uh, and belt that went along with it. Yeah, there were, there were several Special Forces units. The uh, Office of Strategic Services, where the, the, where the modern day Special Forces guys draw their lineage, was actually started uh, next to the British. Uh, the British Special Operations Executive started our Office of Strategic Services. Uh, a lot of the guys traced their lineage back to the airborne units of, uh, of World War II because airborne was a, was a means of insertion. So, uh, so we, we all share a common lineage. Uh, you had the Rangers who were uh, basically a, a, an attack element and they were, they were light infantry. Uh, they, they operated uh, generally in Normandy but they were also in, uh, in Italy and uh, you know, went, went through France into Germany. We also had, uh, what I'm wearing today is uh, the 17th Airborne Division. So the 17th Airborne Division uh, came from the States and their first uh, combat, if you will, was to go into the Ardennes offensive uh, against the Battle of the Bulge. They were, they were the first uh, forces to go in and counterattack, along with Patton's tanks. Oh, from World War II to now, it's, it's, uh, it's night and day. I mean, World War II was, uh, was leather, steel, cotton, wool. Uh, today we have uh, different fabrics, you know, it's, it's a lot of lighter equipment, it's, uh, but a lot of it is the same design. And you'll see it ebbs and flows. When we're in combat, it, uh, it shoots up and the innovation shoots up, then we kind of plateau uh, for a while, and then you go back into combat and, and, and it shoots up. But the, uh, we, we want to revere the guys that went before us because those are the guys, you know, we stand on their shoulders. They got us to our part in history. And uh, I recently jumped into uh, Normandy, France, and uh, for the 75th anniversary of, of D-Day, we jumped into Carentan and then we walked the battlefields that our forefathers walked.